Well, Casey, we just talked about data and AI and how AI companies are harvesting and using material to train their language models. But I want to talk about something else that has been in the news this week, which is this data privacy bill. Yeah, and I'm so glad we're talking about data privacy because I recently learned that there are cameras in this room and they've been uploading everything we say onto YouTube. (laughs) No, come on. I've been picking my nose this whole time. (laughs) So you have been talking specifically to me about the need for a federal data privacy bill in the United States for many years now. I feel like this is the thing that you you sort of like lean on hard whenever anyone talks about data privacy. You're like, why don't we have a freaking bill already? Yes, it's because it really is just, fa- there are so many ways that tech companies like could be better, but in order to force them to be better, you have to create some sort of basic privacy rights. It's kind of a building block around which you can build a lot of other protections. So yeah, that's why I harp about it so much. So- Something that happened this week that caught my attention is that we actually might have a federal data privacy bill. Yeah, this is crazy. Yeah. So if you say things enough, they manifest. That's what I learned from reading The Secret. And um, (laughs) and so it seems like you have personally manifested an attempt to pass a comprehensive federal data privacy bill in these United States. This is a classic example of something that the vast majority of people agree on and Congress just has not been able to get it done. But to your point, this was the big surprise. It does appear that maybe, maybe, maybe Congress may about to do something. Yeah. So we have been waiting for Congress to pass a bill like this for more than 20 years. Um, there's near universal bipartisan agreement that the federal government needs to do something about data privacy in this country. Many other countries have already passed very comprehensive. Most even. <laughs> most countries have passed data privacy bills. Uh, and we've had dozens of hearings about data privacy, lots of proposals for addressing data collection by tech companies and other companies. But up until now, none of these bills have gained significant bipartisan support. And then along came APRA. APRA! The American Privacy Rights Act. Yeah, so this bill was proposed this week by two co-sponsors, both from Washington State, Kathy McMorris Rogers, who's a Republican Congresswoman and the chair of the House Committee on Energy and Commerce, and Maria Cantwell, who's a Democratic Senator. She's the chair of the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science and Transportation. They unveiled this big sort of comprehensive federal privacy bill, and it appears to have a shot of actually passing. Yeah, it's by, and by that I mean bipartisan and bicameral. <laughs> yes. So to talk about this proposed bill, what's in it, how it compares to other privacy laws around the world, and whether it actually has a chance in hell of passing, we've invited on Trevor Hughes. Trevor is the president and CEO of the International Association of Privacy Professionals. It's a group that uh, does training and provides education for privacy privacy professionals around the world. You know, I looked up their phone number and address, couldn't find them anywhere. (laughs) They're very good. They're very good. And Trevor has been following this bill closely, and he's here to talk to us all about it. Let's bring in Trevor Hughes. Trevor Hughes, welcome to Hard Fork. Hi, it's great to be here. Great to have you. Um, So just give us the kind of, you know, 30-second overview of what is in this bill, the American Privacy Rights Act. So this is a comprehensive national privacy law that is in draft form. It actually hasn't even been introduced as a bill yet. We expect that to happen soon. And it's comprehensive. So it's tough to cover it all in 30 seconds, but basically it provides a very broad platform for the use of data in American society. And I use the word society um, with purpose because it's yes, the private sector, but also not-for-profit organizations, common carriers, a whole bunch of our digital world gets uh, gets pulled into to this new draft. So it, I, I know that it's, it's a long bill and it's in draft form and it could change, but give us like some of the, the key plank. How will people actually be affected if this thing becomes law? Yeah, so all of us are used to seeing privacy notices already and not reading them. All of us are used to seeing consent statements and trying to click through them as quickly as we can. Um, There'll be a little bit of that still, but notably under this law, um, data minimization is a core theme. It basically says that you cannot use data unless, unless it's necessary and proportionate to the use that you are gathering the data for. So if you are subscribing to a newsletter, you can't get household income because that's not necessary and proportionate to giving your email address over for a newsletter. So there's a big change. We may see that there are less requests for our data. 
Another big change I think that we will see is that there are significant data subject rights in this draft. So the ability to see your data, many organizations today don't have to show you the data that they hold on you. Under this law, they would have to show you, first of all, they also have to give you the ability to correct it, to edit it, to you have the ability in some circumstances to delete it. If a company does something wrong, if so, an organization using your data so, does something wrong, you may have the ability to sue them under this law. And that's a brand new standard that American uh, uh, citizens, American consumers have not had yet really at, at a federal level for sure and, at, and only at a very limited level at, at the state level. Some of the biggest data privacy scandals and stories that we talk about in this show, things like uh, GM's sale of customer driving data to companies like LexisNexis, which we talked about with Cashmere Hill a few weeks ago, are not done by what we would consider tech companies. But something that we are you know, all learning as a society is that everything is a tech company now, and, and a lot of things that we may not think of as being collecting as, as collecting our data actually are. So would this law primarily apply to tech companies per se, or is there some uh, sort of other broader definition of a data collection company that would apply yeah. here? Would it apply to something like uh, a car maker? Yeah, so the answer is an emphatic yes. Let me walk you through really quickly. First of all, the, the draft applies to covered entities broadly. Covered entities are defined really, really broadly. Um, small businesses are carved out. That's companies that uh, bring in less than $40 million a year in revenue. But when we looked at it, uh, and we just looked at it yesterday, we think there's just under 90,000 companies in the United States that qualify as uh, as covered entities that are not small businesses at the same time. So whether they're a car manufacturer, whether they're a retailer, whether they're a tech company, a bank, a hospital, are going to get pulled in. Let's also note things like the AARP and, you know, the, the Heart Association, that, like, they're going to get pulled in too. Thank God. I'm so tired of the AARP knowing how old I am. That's <laughs> yeah. none of their business. <laughs> you and I both, man. You and I both. Um there are two other important categories of, of entities uh, in, in the draft as it stands. One is um, large data-driven organizations, and that's organizations that have to qualify under uh, uh, a few standards. One, over $250 million in revenue, but also there, there are data standards, like how many actual data subjects are you processing data on. That's going to cover the biggest of players, the banks, the hospital um, uh, holding companies. The other is that data brokers have some particularly restrictive standards in this draft bill. Now, Trevor, can you just let us in a little bit behind the scenes here. I mean, lawmakers yeah. in the U.S. have been trying to, uh, you know, enact some sort of federal data privacy law for years. There have been other similar bills that were proposed and then killed or never made it out of committee. So what is it about this moment that has made at least some lawmakers more willing to consider going forward with something like this? Here are some of the broad environmental factors that I think are particularly compelling right now. First of all, the U.S. is an outlier. The U.S. is an outlier. Um, uh, look at the G7. The U.S. is the only G7 nation without a national privacy law. Look at the G20. The U.S. is the only G20 nation. I would note that the G20 includes South Africa and Saudi Arabia, and the U.S. does not have a national privacy law. By the way, the, Sa the Saudi Arabia national privacy law is that uh, MBS gets to look at any of your data that he wants. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that yeah. may be the case. Yeah, maybe the case. There are 137 nations that have national privacy law around the world. 79% of the world's population is covered by a national privacy law, but not the United States. That's what we like it's, to call American exceptionalism. It, my it is exceptional for yeah, sure. Yeah. It's absolutely exceptional. It's it's just exceptionally odd. This this country that is the largest economy in the world has not been able to pull together a national privacy law yet. I also think that there are factors at play that are notable. AI uh, policy discussions have gotten to a point where there's a recognition that you can't go too much further unless you've got baseline privacy legislation. 
let's throw onto that pile all of the work on kids' privacy and kids' safety that's happening right now. You can't get very far without baseline privacy legislation. Let's also throw onto that pile the TikTok and data transfer standards. They've gotten to a point where they realize we can't get very far unless we have national privacy legislation in, in, in place. So basically, let me just clarify what I just heard from you and you tell me if I got it wrong. So you're saying that part of the reason that we are at this moment now where the U.S., which has lagged behind many other nations in creating national data privacy laws, part of the reason that we're here at this juncture where it may actually be viable is that there is a bunch of other stuff that lawmakers want to do that kind of requires as a prerequisite having some kind of national data privacy law. If you want to, you know, ban TikTok or make it stop, you know, exporting user data, uh, if you want to address kids' online safety, you have to have sort of a bedrock of privacy law on the books before you can do any of that. Is that what I'm hearing? I, I, I think that's absolutely right. I think that's absolutely right. I think what's different in this moment, it's sort of a, uh, an odd moment because many of us were predicting that we were not going to see national privacy legislation this year. It's an election year. The, the Congress is having a tough time getting a budget done and funding the government and supporting Ukraine. It, it is really hard to do anything in Congress. And yet now we have this, this significant draft, which looks like it has legs. And I'd note that um, there's going to be a hearing in the House next week. It's as fast-tracked as I've ever seen, to be sure. Wow. So I'd be curious then, uh, and I think that's a sort of great overview of the the kind of like broader landscape, but my understanding is that there have been, as you say, some recent previous efforts to make a bill like this, and they, they've gone nowhere. So were there any crucial compromises that were made here that let uh, this bill get uh, bipartisan uh, sponsorship? Yeah, a couple of or three things. Let's just identify the two sponsors. It's Senator Maria Cantwell. It is also uh, Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers. It's notable that uh, it's bipartisan. And so we have a bipartisan bill. It's bicameral. It's also notable that Maria Cantwell really stood in the way of the ADPPA coming to committee two years ago. And one of the big reasons she indicated for that was she was concerned about the right of action, the ability to sue under the law. She was concerned about um, arbitration standards and preemption in uh, the ADPPA, the prior bill. But the three major issues, private cause of action preemption and uh, arbitration all seem to have been negotiated politically in this in this draft bill. Right. Preemption being kind of the ability of the federal law to kind of supersede and supplant these individual state laws, some of which already exist, and private right of action being like individuals can sue companies for misusing their data. I, I want to ask Trevor about how this compares to data privacy laws in other countries. In Europe, GDPR, we know, went into effect six years ago. And there have been some studies about sort of what the effect of GDPR has been on companies that operate in Europe. One study found that the main effect that GDPR has had was just making small and medium-sized businesses uh, slightly less profitable. And that basically, if you're a big company, if you're Apple, if you're Google, if you're you know, meta, um, if you have tons of money to sort of hire all the people that you need to comply with these regulations, um, you know, they're not seeing a ton of uh, hit to their business from things like GDPR. So do, do you think that this American version of a privacy law might do essentially the same thing, might sort of take a little profit out of the pockets of kind of mid-sized companies, and that the big companies would essentially sail through unscathed? Um, so really tough question to answer. Let me offer some some broad thoughts on this. First of all, I don't think there's much in this draft that is not already a good business practice in the digital economy. Um, there is not much in here that that organizations that have been paying attention to how they are handling data should find surprising. And so in terms of additional costs, I, I probably wouldn't predict that there will be significant additional costs for most organizations. Because they're already having to comply with all these other countries' comply privacy laws. Comply or, look, there are many organizations in the United States that are not obligated to put a privacy statement on their website, but it is 100% 
good business practice to put a privacy statement on your website. If you haven't looked at how your organization's handling data, if you haven't thought about, hey, are we using third-party advertising? Are we collecting sensitive information here? Why do we need this biometric data in this circumstance? If you haven't been thinking about those things, you haven't been paying attention to some really important risks, regardless of what compliance obligations you might have under the law. Um, participating in the digital economy comes with responsibilities for treating data appropriately. And I think much of what is in this draft already exists as benchmarked good digital economy practices. What's different in this law is that the enforcement, the teeth, associated with getting it wrong are now sharper and and more pronounced. And so I think organizations will see their risk um, profile elevate for, for not getting these things right. And yes, um, some smaller organizations, notably the sponsors have been very clear to exempt small businesses. And so it's any business under $40 million in revenue. Um, uh, some medium-sized, smaller organizations are going to have to comply. The IEPP, we're 300 employees. We will have to comply because we are over the thresholds. But that shouldn't be anything new for organizations. That Casey, what about attention. Platformer? Are you less than 40 million in revenue? <laughs> we're just sort of barely under the limit. I, you know, I'll say I'm glad that the IAPP will finally have to answer for privacy. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's yeah. being brought we've to, been, brought we've to been heal. We've shirking our duties <laughs> yeah. for a long time. Yeah. All this privacy stuff, we talk a good game, but it's a, you it's know. a load, off, load off of my shoulders. Let, let me ask you this, Trevor. You know, I, I'm curious if you see any sort of holes in this bill. Is there any aspect of privacy that Congress seems like it hasn't wanted to, to touch yet that maybe, you know, it is common in the many other countries that have passed a law like this? I don't see any major holes. Let's let's also just highlight something, and that is that privacy emerges from cultural expectations of privacy. And cultural expectations of privacy differ all around the world. And so what is private in Europe, what is private in India is different than what is private in the United States. And the laws reflect those differences. So I think this law is as complete a law as we have seen emerge um, in the U.S. in the 25 years that we have seen broad-based bills emerge. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious. For the average person who is listening to this and thinking, well, you know, maybe I have spent some time in Europe and I use the internet there. And the only difference that I see is that I have to click through a bunch of like allow cookie pop ups. <laughs> that's, that's sort of the only tangible difference that I feel. And maybe they're wondering to themselves, like, well, what are the stakes of this for me? How will my experience of using the internet or using internet connected appliances in my house, how will any of that be different if this bill passes? What's your answer to that? I think there's a lot of things. Um, some of the consequences are going to be less visible to the average user, and probably rightly so. You know, when I uh, when I walk into my office here and flip on the light switch, I don't need to know what the code requirements are for wiring and the underwriter laboratory standards for light bulb safety are. I just want the light to work. I want it to switch on when I walk in the room. We want our technological services to work for us. This bill is kind of the legal code, the code that sits behind the wall that helps to make all of us safer to make sure these things work. This is, this is good kind of hygiene for our digital economy. Right. Got it. So there's, uh, it's always difficult to guess what my Congress might do in a case like this. So I don't think it's even worth really predicting. But I do wonder, Trevor, if you can share, what are the next things you expect to happen with this bill? And what are signs that you could see that would make you think, oh, okay, this thing might actually be moving ahead? So we held our annual conference in D.C. last week. We have 5,000 attendees there. We had 35 governments from around the world. And we were standing up in front of them all and saying, no way will we see national privacy law in the United States this year. 100 percent no way. And then when many of our attendees were hung over and we were all on planes <laughs> flying back home, what happens? But we get a leak that there might be a bill over the weekend. And then it's Sunday on a four o'clock in between a New York earthquake and a New England eclipse. Um, Congress drops a major privacy bill on us. And the more we've looked at it, 
the more we've come to the perspective that, gosh, this thing might have legs. Mm. This thing might have legs. And there's a few reasons for that. I've mentioned some of them. It's bipartisan. It's bicameral. It's the chairs of the two most important committees on this thing. But here's the other thing. It just doesn't make sense to waste the political capital to introduce this bill mm. if there's not a path to the finish line. And I, and that's one of the reasons that I'm perhaps more bullish than some of the DC cynics who don't think that anything can happen right now. My point of view is just why would they even bother if that's the answer? It feels to me like this thing and has And as legs. you said, there is a hearing set for next week on the subject. We've got a hearing next week, and I'm going to note for you that it's, yes, the APRA, the American Privacy Rights Act, but they've got eight other privacy-related bills that they're considering in that hearing. And there is some question right now as to whether the APRA is going to be like a Christmas tree with a bunch of stuff hanging on it, and we see kids' privacy and AI and TikTok data transfers all kind of hung on the APRA Christmas tree, and that's like the big gift to um, uh, to the United States this year. Well, when it comes to the APRA or APRA as they're calling it, I am I am a little less apprehensive after talking <laughs> to you today, Trevor. Wow, I was waiting for the pun to to, to come out, and I'm calling for my co-host to be apprehended for all of these <laughs> puns. <laughs> all right, Trevor, we'll let you go. Thanks so much. Thanks, Trevor. Great talking this to you. This is a ton of fun. Thank you both. <laughs> all right, take care. Hey, that's the end of this clip. If you liked what you saw, head on over to our page and subscribe and you can get the full podcast. We do a show like this almost every week on tech and the future. Head on over there now and subscribe. <laughs>